Hello, this is uh, our first video lecture for the Probability 1 graduate class for the summer 2015. And uh, today what I want to do is just give an introduction to what it is to be a probability, uh, which has to do with a set fu uh, function on uh, the event space for a random experiment. And then I want to do uh, some examples as well as give a classical definition for probabilities uh, when everything in the outcome space is equally likely to happen, which has to do with uh, counting. Um, so we'll have to do a little review of counting as well. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to do is give a definition. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what is a random experiment? So a random experiment is an experiment um, in which the outcome is left to chance So it's not determined what the outcome will be when you uh, do the experiment. So an example is if a um, coin is tossed, that's a random experiment. You're either going to get heads or tails, but you don't know which when you just toss the coin. And another example is a six-sided die is rolled. So you don't know what you're going to get when you roll that die. There's one of the one through six maybe labelings on the sides of the die. So that's a random experiment. Next, we want to talk about sample space. So it's the definition. The sample space. for a random experiment. Is the collection, so it's a set, of all possible outcomes For the experiment. So that's what a sample space is. Uh, the sample space is noted by script S usually for sample. So here's two examples. You have a coin is tossed, and then the sample space associated with this would be the outcomes, which would be either you've got heads or tails. And then another example, a die is rolling, and so the sample space here might be the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Next thing I want to talk about is an event. An event from a <clears throat> random experiment.
is a subset, subcollection of the sample space. Let's see, simple example. Let's say a die is rolled. Then, as we saw earlier, the sample space is equal to the outcomes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Then, let's call it E. Let's call it E sub 1 for one event. Uh, could be the subset 2, 4, 6. So that's the event that you got an even die roll. You could have, so that is an event. So is E sub 2, which equals to, let's say, uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And you could think of this event as the event that the die roll was 3 or bigger. So those are events. All right, that's the background material needed to define, uh, well, almost needed to define property. We need one more thing. It's a definition. <clears throat> Two events, E1 and E sub 2, are said to be mutually exclusive. is going to be having a lot of set theory involved in it. It's an underlying uh, basis for probability in part. And so um, here, what we mean by intersection, I'm not going to go over it in detail, but what we mean by intersection is what's in common between these two sets. And what we're saying is in common is nothing. So as an example, if we say a die is rolled, Then, again, we have the sample space is equal to uh, set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then, if I look at E1 to be equal to 1 and 2, let's make E2 to be equal to 4 and 6, and E3 to be equal to 2, 3, uh, five. Then E1 and E2 are mutually exclusive. Okay. That is their intersection. What's in common between the set one and two and, uh, and the set four and six is nothing. Okay? Uh, but E1 and E3 are not mutually exclusive. And the reason that E1 and E3 are not mutually exclusive is that they have two in common. Okay.
Now we can find what the probability is. So here's the sketch. A probability is a set function. We call it P. Whose domain is um, the collection of events from a random experiment. Satisfying, it satisfies the fault. Satisfies each one of the fault, okay? So all of these are satisfied. Here, there's three, going to be three things. One, <clears throat> that zero is less than or equal to the probability of E, which is less than or equal to one. And that's true for all. Uh, event C. So if you're an event, the probability of that event happening is somewhere between 0 and 1. Inclusive. Could be 0, could be 1. 2. Well, I take one, subspace, uh, one subset of the sample space, and that is the sample space itself. And it turns out that the probability of the sample space is 1. That makes a lot of sense. The, the sample space consists of all possible outcomes. So the probability that something occurred when you do a random experiment, that one of those outcomes occurred, well, that ought to be 100%. That's one. And then thirdly, it's a little bit longer, it says if E1, E2, forever, uh, is a sequence of events, I'll say, of mutually exclusive events. What that means, that is, EI intersect EJ equals to the empty set when I is different than J. So if you take any two of the events and intersect them where they're not the same event, you get the empty space. Empty set. Um, then, the probability of uh, the union of the EIs. So I run from one to fifth here. Is equal to the sum, as I run from one to infinity, of the probabilities of the EIs. So if we were to add, that's what union means, put combine them together, all the events and then you take the probability of that, that's going to be equal to the sum of each individual, uh, the, uh, of the probability of each individual, uh, individual event. That's what that is. Um, on kind of a smaller scale, uh, to illustrate this, let's just say we had two events, let's call this E1, and this is E2, where the circles represent the event. So if you're in here, you're in event one, if you're in here, you're in and you see they don't have any overlap. Maybe this box represents my sample space. Then I uh, hope it's very uh, clear to you uh, that if you were to say, well, 
if we were to combine this to say, what's the probability this happens or this happens? It's the same thing as the probability this happening plus the probability that happens. We think of it as kind of like buying a property in this box, the sample space, is worth one dollar. And here's part of the property, and here's another part of the property, and they don't overlap. And you say, what's the probability of the union of these? I want to buy these two sections of the, prop the, of the property. Then what the, the, the worth of that, the probability of these two guys combined, ought to be the probability of this one, the worth of this one, plus the probability of this one. So that's what this last part means. As an example, and remember we're defining the probability. If we say a coin, is flipped. Then again, don't forget we have the sample space is equal to heads or tails. <clears throat> then it turns out, with that being the sample space, there are four subsets of the sample space. And so I'm going to define the probability on those four of those four sample space uh, sub subsets to be. The probability of the empty set, that's one of the subsets, is zero. The probability of just getting the heads, I'm going to say that's one third. P of a tails, I'm going to say that's two thirds. And then finally, P of the sample phase, heads or tails, that's going to be equal to one. Then, P is a probability. So this defines a probability on this tossing of the coin. And you see that this really doesn't match what we think of with the coin of chances of happening. Maybe this is an unfair coin where the chance of getting a tail uh, is twice as likely of that of getting a head okay, in this situation. And then uh, you could have the same uh, type of situation with another coin that is fair, where the probability of head is one half and the probability of tails is one half. So on a, uh, an experiment, you can have more than one probability on, on the, the event space. Okay? You can find a probability, different probabilities on the same event space. But this is an example of a probability. Um, I want to give you a kind of a fact or definition. It's called a classical definition of probability. It says the following. It says, if the outcome of a random experiment are equally likely to occur. to be able to count, because we're talking about the number of ways things can happen. Let me uh, 
fall back just a little bit to something called experimental probability definition. So this is the classical definition. We use this when we know all outcomes are equally likely to occur. Well, that experimental definition here's another definition so this is the experimental definition it says um, the probability of an event <coughs> is equal to the limit is n goes to infinity of uh, the number of times the event occurs uh, over n. So I guess n, I'll write this way. The number of times e occurs over n. Okay. Uh, um, where n represents the number of times the experiment is different. chance of something happening is, then experimentally we can figure this out. And the way that we do this is we say, okay, I want to know what the chance of this event occurring is. We perform the experiment. We say, did the event happen or not? Then we perform the experiment again. We say, did the event happen or not? We perform the experiment again. Did the event happen or not? And we just keep counting by performing the experiment over and over and over again. The number of times that the event happened and we divide that by the number of times we did the experiment. And that, as, it, as we keep doing the experiment more and more and more, that hopefully goes to a number and tells us what the probability of that event occurring is. So if you wanted to uh, see what the probability of getting heads is, and you had a coin, and uh, what you do, if it was a, let's say, for example, you had a fair coin, what you do to find the probability of heads, we'd expect it to be one half. But you could do this experimentally to make sure the coin is fair. By flipping the coin, and you keep flipping the coin, and you count how many times you get heads out of the, the number of times you, you flip the coin. And eventually, you would see that that fractional number, the number of times you got heads, or the number of times that you flipped the coin, that if you kept, kept doing that, um, kept uh, pounding that fraction, uh, then you'd see that that fraction tends to a half. That's what we see if it's a fair coin. If it doesn't, then we see that the coin is not fair. All right, anyway, we're going to go back to using our definition here of, of the classical definition when we know that we're in a situation when all the outcomes are equally likely to happen. So I'm going to give an example of this. Okay, so as an example, let's uh, uh, suppose a coin is tossed. I'm sorry, let's suppose a die is rolled. Okay, so here our sample place is. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And someone says, find the probability 
of the event, I'd say three, four, five, six. Well, this answer is, no, if all, and this is the assumption we're making, if all outcomes are equally likely, are equally likely to occur, the probability Three, four, five, six is equal to the number in the set of three, four, five, and six. Over the number in the uh, sample space, which is one, two, three, four, five, six. Which equals to, well, the number in this set is four, and the number in this sample space is six, so it's two thirds. So the chance, if everything's equally likely when you roll the die, to get a number that's three or bigger when the die roll is two thirds of the time. Uh, similarly, another example of all of this. If I were to ask, what's the probability of uh, 2, 4, 6 in the same setting where we roll the die, the answer is going to be 3 out of 6, which is 1 half. And that's what we expect when we roll a die and are asked the question, what's the chance that I got an uh, even number? About half the time. Half the time, not about half the time, you'll get an even number, and half the time, then you'll get an odd number. Okay. Well, with uh, that work there about uh, the classical definition to this example, we can see it. Uh, we have the need for being able to count a number of ways that certain things happen. So uh, here is some counting principles that we'll look at next. The first counting principle. So here's some counting principles. The first one is called the sequential uh, counting principle. Okay. Some people call it the basic principle of counting. And I'm going to give this generic form. Says if an uh, event. When I say event here, I'm not meaning for a probability uh, event. I just mean if an occurrence. If an event, an occurrence. Uh, if an event A can happen in n sub what way. And for each of these n sub 1 ways, event uh, B can happen, <clears throat> let's call this A sub 1. Event A sub 2 can happen in n sub 2 ways. And for each of these n sub 1 times n sub 2 ways, event uh, a sub 3 can happen in n sub 3 ways.
and so on. until event A sub M can happen in N sub M ways, then the sequence of events A sub 1, A sub 2, uh, uh, follow all the way up to A sub M, can occur in N sub 1 times, N sub 2 times, N sub 3 times, all the way up to being multiplied by N sub M number of ways. We'll look at an example of that. So as an example, let's say uh, a diner has a blue plate special consisting of one meat, one veggie, One a drink. Gosh, I didn't look this up how to spell it. And, and one dessert. I think it's got two S's in it. I don't know. Maybe it has one S in it. I don't know. Okay? So one dessert. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. You get to choose one of each one of the offerings in these categories. I need to give a little bit more detail. In terms of the offerings. <clears throat> the meats are okay, we could have beef, chicken, pork. So that's M. Uh, the veggies, that's D, is equal to, let's say, corn, okra, beans. And let's say the drinks, that's BR. That's equal to Mountain Dew, water, tea. I say that's all we got. And then the desserts. <clears throat> uh, that's equal to apple pie, a pecan pie, cake. Question. How many blue plate specials are possible? So the answer here is very easy and use the basic principle of counting or the sequential counting principles to decide this. You're going through the line, you're going to pick a meat. So here's the answer. You figure out how many ways there are possible to select each one of these categories, and you multiply them together. Okay, so you got to pick a meat. So how many meats are there available to pick? One, two, three, four. So there's four. And you multiply that for each one of the meats that you could pick 
There are one, two, three choices of veggies for each one of you. That gives you a total of 12 possible selections for having a meat and a vegetable on your plate. And for each one of those, you got to pick a, a drink. Okay? There's three of those. Okay. And then, <clears throat> um, now we have uh, to pick a dessert. And so we multiply this answer by how many desserts are possible. One, two, three, four, five. So that ends up being 120, I think. So let's see. There's uh, 15, 45. Uh, that's 45. It's not 120. Uh, so uh, let's see. 45. Uh, that's 9. I think it's 180. So it's 180 blue plate specials. Another type of common counting technique that will be involved involved in probability in general is that of permutation. So what's a permutation? <clears throat> a permutation of N distinct objects is a listing of the indistinct objects. Is, and I should say is an ordered, make that change, ordered list. <clears throat> so as an example, Let's say um, we had the letters A, B, C, and D. Then A, B, C, D is a permutation one permutation and C, A, B, D is another permutation of these objects. Okay, <clears throat> we're interested in how many permutations there are for the objects. And uh, here, in terms of notation, if, uh, if we let n uh, be an element of the counting numbers, the natural numbers, then uh, n factorial and that's represented by n with an exclamation point, so n factorial, is given by n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 uh, times all the way down to 2 and 1. As an example, um, 5 factorial is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and that's equal to 120. So that's 5 factorial. 6 factorial, that's a lot bigger. It's 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and that's 720. You see the numbers get really big quickly. Um, in terms of a convention, we define zero factorial, even though zero is not considered a natural number, 
We define it to be equal to 1 so that formulas will work out. As a fact, um, the number of permutations of indistinct objects is in factorial. Let me do an example. Um, find the number of permutations of the letters A, B, C. Well, there's three letters here, so we have three factorial, which is three times two times one. That's six. Well, six is not that many. I, I'll write those down. So, namely, <clears throat> you have A, B, C, so that's the first one on the list. Remember the order. Distinct, they're order listing. So that's A, B, C, two. Could be um, A, C, B, three. So that's the two with A, B first. Now B could be first. So B, A, C, four. You could have B, C, A. So those are the two with B, B first. And then five, you could have C, A, B, six, C, B, A. Those are the six. Well, it turns out that sometimes you get into situations where you're wanting to find permutations, the number of order listings, of n object, indistinct objects, but you don't want to use all n of them. You want to use a certain number of them, fixed number of them. And there's a formula for that. So here's a fact. The number... Well, let me give a definition first. <clears throat> a permutation of n distinct objects taken R at a time is an ordered listing of R of the N objects. Not a specific, um, I should say, R number. Distinct objects. It isn't that we have the same R objects at the end every time. Okay? It's that we're just picking R of the objects and then uh, arranging them in order. As a fact, the number of ways that that can be done, uh, the number of permutations. N distinct objects taken R at a time is, well, it's denoted 
by E, that's uh, not probability, permutation of N choose R, which is N factorial, N factorial is what I wrote, over N minus R factorial, and that can be thought of as N times N minus 1 times N minus 2 times, you go down to N minus R plus 1, and then there's N minus R, and you keep going, you go down to 1, and that's over N minus R, N minus R minus 1, all the way down to 1. And this part right here, the n minus r all the way down to 1, and this n minus r multiplied uh, by the numbers less than it all the way down to 1. They cancel. And so what you're left with is n times n minus 1 all the way down to n minus r plus 1. n minus r plus 1. That's what that says. Let's look at an example. As an example, let's say a club has 13 members, and uh, will elect uh, officers for president, vice president, Secretary and Treasurer. Okay. How many ways or how many election outcomes are possible? If no person can hold more than one office. Person, each club member, let's say, um, could be elected for any office. So here's the solution. This is a perfect description of where we use uh, permutations uh, in choose R. So we've got 13 uh, uh, club members, and we want to elect four of them. And if you say uh, Al, Bob, uh, Carl, and Dan were elected, and you list them in that order, uh, what we're thinking is Al was president, maybe, and that uh, Bob was vice president, uh, that Carl was uh, secretary, and Dan was treasurer. And if you list them in another order, let's say Bob, uh, uh, Al, uh, Dan, and Carl, you're thinking Bob was president. You're thinking that Al was vice president. Uh, you're thinking that Dan was secretary, and Carl was a treasurer. And so even though the same four people got elected, it's not the same election result. So the order of those four people, uh, uh, listing of them, distinguished them from each other. And so we think of a permutation. And those may, uh, are not the only four people who could get elected. Okay? So here, the first solution is we think of probability of 13 choose 4. Okay? We had a formula for that. That's 13 factorial over 4 factorial, 
That's 13. I'm sorry, it's not over 4 factorial. It's 13 minus 4 factorial. That's going to be 13 factorial over 9 factorial. This ends up being 13 times 12 times 11 times 10, whatever that is. Okay? That's the solution. That's the first solution. You can also think of it, not only trying to use this formula, but you can think of it through the sequential uh, criterion of counting, in that you need to pick, so this is the second solution, you, th you need to pick a precedent. And everybody is eligible and willing to be president, so there's 13 possible outcomes for that. Now, you need to pick a vice president next. But once you've picked a president, there's only 12 people available. For each one of the president, each one of these ways that a president can be chosen, there's only 12 available to be vice president. And then you need to pick a, a, a secretary. And now there's only 11 people in the club to be eligible for secretary because you've already uh, taken two to be president, vice president. And then for treasurer, there's only 10 available. And by the sequential criterion for, uh, uh, for counting, we multiply these numbers. So we get 13, 12, 11, 10. Okay? So you get the same answer. It's just different ways of looking at it. Formula for the formula for the sequential uh, counting principle or the formula for the permutations. Well, when we talked about permutations, we were talking about order being distinguishing. But there's another type of uh, counting technique that we're going to talk about next. I'm going to run a little over in this first lecture. More than 50 minutes is what I mean by over. The first, uh, this definition is a combination. So a combination of indistinct objects. Taken R at a time is a collection of R of the N object. The number, and this is a fact, the number of combinations, oh wait a minute, I'm sorry, let me do an example. So as a quick example, if I've got the set A, B, C, and D, then a uh, combination of two of these <laughs> objects is the set AD, and so is uh, the set BD. So there are two different combinations. Of two of these options. As a fact, the number of combinations of in distinct objects taken R at a time is C for combinations N choose R, which we represent as N choose R one over the other in, not fraction, but one over the other in parentheses, 
and it's defined to be n factorial over n minus r factorial times r factorial in the bottom. A little different than the number of permutations taken all the time. We've got this division by r factorial here. And let's look at uh, a quick, two quick examples, and then we'll call it this. So as an example, um, the number of combinations of A, B, C, and D taken two at a time is well, if C of 4, 2, 2, which is equal to 4 factorial over 4 minus 2 factorial times 2 factorial, which is equal to 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, all over 2 factorial, 2 times 1, and then times 2 times 1, that ends up being, well, this 2 times 1 cancels this 2 times 1, and we end up with 12 over 2, 2 times 1 is 2, and that's 6. 6 is not that many, I'll be able to list those. So let's see, we could have A, B, so namely, we got A and B, we got A and C, we got uh, A and D, so there's three. Those are all the ones that have A in them. Now, we're going to get the ones that have B in them that don't include A, B, because we've already counted that. And writing B, A is the same thing as A, B, because the order in which we list them is not important. So here I could have B, C. B, uh, D. That's all the ones that have B in them that have been listed. And now we, the only one left is C, D. C, D is the same thing as B, C. That's not distinguishing the order. It's not when you're talking about combination. It's just have a collection. Okay, so those are the six. Well, let's look at an example. Another example. Well, as an example, um, let's say a club has 13 members. Um, and a committee of four of these members. Are to be formed, or is to be formed. Okay, how many ways is this possible? Okay, I'm thinking here that everybody's willing to serve on the committee. Okay, so here's the answer. How many ways are there formed as committees is what I'm asking. The answer is that C of 13 choose 4. So that's equal to 13 factorial over 9 factorial 4 factorial. That's 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times, oh, that's it. All divided by 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So the 4 times 3 cancels with the 12. The 2 times 1 cancels with 10 to the 5. So my answer here is... 13 uh, times 11 times 5, whatever that is, that's the answer. One thing I want you to notice about the difference between uh, permutations and combinations, I'll write it over here, is that with combinations, I'm sorry, with permutations, order is distinguishing, 
and with combinations, it's nine. And so the number of permutations is more than the number of combinations. Let me write that down. So, um, here's what I had just said. We use permutations when order is distinguishing, order of the listing is distinguishing. It makes a difference. combinations when order is not distinguishing. And so, you know, in the, one of the examples I did where we had uh, four letters A, B, C, D, and a combination could be A, B, and that's the only combination that has A and B in it. A permutation having A and B is A, B, and B, A. So there were two of them. So there are more permutations than there are combinations. How many more permutations? There's R factorial in number more. And that's why we have to divide by R factorial. For each one of the permutations that you have, um, the, there are R factorial of them more than there are combinations. Because once you have a fixed R, particular R out of the N distinct options chosen, the number of ways to rewrite them is R factorial. Okay? Whereas just one of those representations represents the combination. Anyway, that's what I want to say for this beginning lecture. Thank you very much for your time and patience.